This time we look at five fabulous three cylinder motorbikes. There's really nothing quite like the sound and feel of a three-cylinder motorbike. Its intoxicating mix, which is somewhere between twin-cylinder and four-cylinder, really gives a great punch but also a good top-end rush, so you get the best of both worlds. It's believed that the first transverse three-cylinder motorcycle was actually created by Motorguzzi in 1932. This was the Tre Cylindri. This used an overhead valve engine, which only produced around 25 horsepower with a top speed of 81 miles an hour. As a result, it didn't sell very well at all and was withdrawn from sale after one year. Motoguzzi did persist with the design and created a dual overhead cam supercharged variant for racing. Unfortunately, this bike was completed in 1940, so it never raced in anger. So despite its advanced design and the use of a 120 crank, in common with many more modern three-cylinder machines, it was not a success. So let's have a look at five rather more successful three-cylinder motorcycles. The Hinkley Triumph Trident. The Hinkley built Trident 750 and 900 Tridents were among the first machines to be produced in the factory and were in production between 1991 and 1998. Many will tell that these engines are based on the old GPZ 900 Quacker engine, which is partially true Kawasaki did assist with the development, but they are fundamentally different in many ways. The chassis is a high tensile steel spine frame, so it uses the engine as a stressed member and looks in some ways slightly similar to the oil and frame design on the T140. But while the chassis design was not cutting edge by the standards of the 1990s and does give the bike a slightly top heavy feel, handling is nevertheless fairly good. But for these bikes it's the engine that is truly the star. The three cylinder engine has a wonderful character all of its own. It's a direct overhead cam liquid cooled motor that is shared amongst the whole range. They used a modular concept, so there's a short stroke and a long stroke versions of both motors, 750 being the shorter stroke and the 900 running a longer stroke, but being essentially the same engines. The 750 produced around 90 horsepower and the 900 somewhere around the 100 horsepower mark. Both engines were famed for their mid-range punch, but it was the 900 that became the real star of the show. The 750 was not a sales success and would eventually fade from the range. The 900 did rather better or would go on to spawn a whole series of derivative machines. The success of the new Tridents would prove an excellent springboard for the Hinkley based Triumph factory. The La Verda Jota The La Verda Jota was a 1000cc Italian made motorcycle. Although it was actually inspired by the Slater brothers, an importer based in the UK. They fitted tuning parts for the engine, as well as different bars and rear set footrests to what was a standard 3C model. The changes meant that the engine now produced around 85 horsepower with a top speed in excess of 130 miles an hour. Well, at least in the UK, Australia and South Africa, where the model was fitted with high lift cams, high compression pistons and that less restrictive and very nice sounding silencer. Ignoring convention, Laverde gave the bike a 180 degree crank spacing. This would later be switched to a 120 which of course made the engine run smoother. But it's the 180s that people really lust after. The early models just plain and simply have a better sound. Yamaha XS750 Introduced in Japan in 1976, the bike would appear in Europe and the United States in 77. It was voted Motorcycle News Machine of the Year in 77, taking the title from Kawasaki's Z1. The machine used dual overhead cams, power its two valves per cylinder. It was a 5 speed gearbox which fed power unusually for the time for a transverse machine to the back wheels via a shaft drive. Early 77 models which arrived in Europe suffered a number of issues. These included a second gear that simply wouldn't stay in and problems with the points ignition. The engine also had some failures with the top end. In order to restore confidence in the bike, Yamaha introduced the 2D model. This had a number of design improvements and electronic ignition. Following the release of this model, international sales did pick up somewhat. They never really achieved the heights that some of its competition did. 
whether this is down to the early reliability problems, or the fact they didn't like the styling, or maybe it was just that three cylinder engines were out of fashion at that time, is difficult to tell. Some say that the shaft drive also hampered sales. The engine produced around 64 horsepower, pulling it slightly off the pace when compared to its four cylinder competitors. Handling and braking was pretty much on par with the rest of the Japanese bikes at the time, so fairly average and not particularly good in the wet. In 1980, the engine was bored out to 826 cc. This helped to improve mid-range torque, and the overall design was much improved, making the 850 the one to go for. In the end, the bike was phased out in 1981, replacing it with the by then standard across the frame Japanese 4. BSA Rocket 3. Alongside its Triumph Tried and Stable mate, the BSA Rocket 3 was introduced in 1968. Originally a Triumph concept, the overall project was much delayed and would have only a few months in the marketplace before the arrival of the CB750, a machine that hit the road with all the bits that the BSA simply didn't have electric start, five speeds, and disc brakes. But despite the horsepower claims of the Honda, it wasn't actually as fast as the Rocket 3, nor did it handle as well. And the disc brakes actually weren't as powerful as they initially appeared, especially in the wet. Unfortunately, the rather compromised design of the Rocket 3, being essentially a Triumph twin with an extra cylinder added, meant that it was more difficult to assemble and was not nearly as well suited to mass production. And its old fashioned design required more maintenance and was more difficult to keep oil tight. But all that aside, the Rocket 3 is a glorious machine. Its 120 degree crank means that it runs fairly smoothly, particularly when compared to a traditional British parallel twin, so it is much better suited to motorways, and handling was, by the standards of the day, extremely good, despite the extra weight of that three cylinder motor. But unfortunately, many prospective buyers were wooed away to the Honda. The overhead valve design simply looked old hat by comparison, and that old fashioned design meant that it simply didn't have all the bells and whistles that the Honda had. And then, of course, there was the styling. Honda played very conservative when it came to styling, and the CB750, despite its four exhausts looking really glorious out of the side, looks fairly standard in its design. The Triumph and BSAs with their Ogle-influenced design looked uneven bought. And there's no doubt that those Raygun exhausts and that squared-off bread bing fuel tank simply didn't strike a chord with the customers at the time, particularly in the all-important American market and even BSA's racing success at the Daytona 200 wasn't enough to really lift sales. In America, the Trident and the Rocket 3 were both released with more standard styling. This did help to lift sales a little, but by 73 BSA had a number of failed products behind them, including the Bandit and Fury parallel twins, and of course the bizarre madness that was the Aerial 3. So the disappointing sales of the three-cylinder flagship only compounded the problems for the company as a whole. And while 73 would finally see the arrival of a 5-speed gearbox, it would also see the collapse of the company. As a result, only around 250 BSA Rocket 3s would ever be built with 5-speed gearboxes before the demise of the company. A sad end for an otherwise excellent machine. BMW K75S. Now whilst the K75 was available as a standard naked model, or even an RT Touring model, it's the slightly more sporty S model that really is the most appealing aesthetically, I think. The first of BMW's K series arrived in 1983 and was a 1000cc horizontally mounted inline four with shaft drive, fuel injection, and double overhead cams of two valves per cylinder. In order to make the engine more compact, they'd use fairly short con rods, and this would contribute towards fairly noticeable secondary vibration periods on the four cylinder motor. The K75 arrived two years later, and this used a three cylinder engine. Essentially, they'd just chopped the end cylinder off the K100. Cleverly, they'd also introduced a balance shaft to the motor, making the K75 without doubt the sweetest of all the K series engines. BMW did a lot of pioneering work with the K-Series. There was liquid cooling and, of course, rather famously, fuel injection. 
They weren't the first to actually get it into production, Kawasaki having beaten them by a couple of years. Their system worked extremely well. And in fact it would be some time before the Japanese actually used fuel injection on a regular basis for their high volume production motorcycles. The K75 was no lightweight, but the chassis was pretty good, the suspension and brakes worked well, and overall the machine handled very well. The K75 made around 75 horsepower, and this is a fairly modest figure by the standards of the time. But in the S model, it was able to hit just over 130 miles an hour, and the machine could maintain high speeds for many hours at a time, so again an excellent intercontinental tourer. The bike has a deserved reputation for build quality and of course sturdiness. The bike can rack up huge mileages and still give excellent service. But for all the many attributes, the K-Series was never quite as popular as BMW had hoped for, and in fact they ended up re-releasing the R-Series to run alongside. So popular were the air-cooled boxers. Either way, the very excellent design of the K-Series means there's an awful lot of machines still out there. What quirky collections of bikes would you like to see on video? Please drop us a line below with your suggestions and we'll see what we can do. I do hope you enjoyed that video and if you did, don't forget to like and subscribe and of course, thank you very much for watching.